Since around 1947, folks have claimed that men in dark suits have interrogated them and spooked them after seeing or experiencing strange supernatural phenomenon. Some say they are supernatural themselves, and others believe they are government officials that are involved with other worlds. Here are five allegedly true stories about the men in black. Just a quick heads up about this video. The first two stories are brand new, but the latter three are re-uploaded from my first Men in Black video. YouTube apparently didn't like that video, so I deleted it and I'm reposting the stories with new ones. So this is basically a re-upload with bonus stories. Enjoy. I'm doing creepy confessions from joggers next, so if you've got a story, be sure to send it to me at darknessprevails.org slash submit. Thank you. My Farmer Father by Cletus C. I grew up on my family's farm, land they'd owned in Nebraska for the past 40 years. But when I was still a baby, my father experienced something that he would never forget. He was 30 at the time, and I was around two or three years old. My mother tells me that when this happened, I was sleeping, but I had this story told to me by my father on numerous occasions. He swears up and down that this story is completely true. It was the beginning of summer on a very warm night. My father, starved after a hard day's work, was helping to finish off the leftovers when my mother and father suddenly heard a massive boom coming from overhead outside the house. Before they could even get up, they saw a strobing white light falling into the nearby cornfield. When it hit, debris was launched everywhere, and though it was about 100 yards out, my mother claims that some of the debris hit the window and cracked it. So you can imagine how frightened and surprised they were. My mother looked at my father without a word, and he knew what he had to do. He grabbed his hat and slipped on his boots, then left toward the cornfield with our golden retriever, Rusty, who had been going crazy ever since the thing crashed. It was easy to find where it landed. My father said there was so much dust still in the air that it pinpointed its location perfectly. It took him maybe a minute to walk to where the thing landed, and once there, he waited maybe five more minutes for the dust to settle. When the crash site cleared up, my dad says he was surprised to see that the object left a rather pathetic looking crater that resembled more of a gopher hole. And what was sticking out of it was the most bizarre thing he'd ever seen. It was metallic, had absolutely no surface scratches or damage to it. The object was about the length of his forearm and the thickness of his fist. It was shaped like a teardrop with the rounded end buried beneath the soil. He reached out to touch it, but then pulled his arm back, thinking that whatever it was could be extremely hot. But his curiosity took over and he placed his hand on the surface of the object. He yanked away in pain. The thing wasn't hot. In fact, it was so cold that it had caused his skin to stick to it when he touched it, like when you pull an ice cube from the freezer and lick it and it sticks to you. Rusty had gone completely silent by then. I guess both their curiosities had been satiated. My dad was more bewildered than anything. He said he wanted to know what it was and where it came from. He had heard the old wives tell that planes would drop blue ice from the sky, which was supposed to be frozen waste but he had always been sure it was just a myth. I mean, how legal could it be to dump waste on people? Plus, the thing was so metallic, so bizarrely textured, that he knew he couldn't just leave it out here. Plus, it'd probably make a great story, he thought. He took off his plaid shirt, then picked up the weird object. And that's when he noticed something else strange, for something that appeared to be completely solid and metal. He said it weighed about as much as an apple. He carried the thing back home, and once safely inside, he showed my mom, and the two of them simply stared at it for what seemed like 30 minutes. The only words muttered were questions, rhetorical questions that neither of them could really answer, like what was it? Where did it come from? 
Why did it land here? What was it made of? The silver metallic immaculate object laid there on my dad's shirt on the kitchen table until they both realized that they weren't going to get any answers and they needed some sleep. So my dad, wrapping it up, placed it into the chest in the living room, which had been just for decoration until that night. My father, finishing up a cup of water in the kitchen after doing so, was just about to head upstairs to take a shower before bed when the door knocked. It was coming from the kitchen door, which was the back door, which immediately spooked my father. The only people that made use of the back door were my mom and dad because they worked the fields. Hesitantly, my dad stepped over to the door. There he saw through the curtain in the window of it, two tall human-like silhouettes. He swallowed hard, unlocked the chain on the door, then opened it. There stood two large men, both of whom were dressed identically in black shades and black fedoras and completely black suits and black ties. The only thing they were wearing that wasn't black was their dress shirts, which were completely white. And once again, he saw that the suits, like the object, were completely immaculate, as if the men had just pulled their clothes from the dryer. My father looked them over and then asked them, what can I do for you fellas? The one to his left stayed silent and began to poke his tongue out of his mouth and lick his lips. This was something that throughout their conversation, that man continued to do over and over as if he couldn't keep his lips moisturized. It really creeped my dad out. The man on the right seemed to do all the talking. He answered my father. Sir, have you seen anything strange lately? We work for your government, and we've had reports around these parts. Some lights in the sky. Have you seen anything like that? My father, nervous, lied to them. No, no, sir. I haven't seen nothing like that around here. If people are claiming to see lights around here, it's probably swamp gas getting to their heads. He chuckled a bit, but the men kept straight faces. After about 10 seconds of silence that was entirely awkward, the man on the right spoke up again. In this kind of matter, lying could be treated as treason in a court of law. Do you know what the punishment for treason is? He knew what the guy was talking about, and it sounded like a threat. The left guy snaked his tongue back out and started licking his lips once more, fervently, and then the two turned around and walked away. He noticed that the men walked straight into the cornfield where he had found the object, and not once did he see a vehicle, meaning these men must have walked all the way out here, or got here by other means. My father quickly locked the door, then ran to the living room and checked the chest. Maybe he should report this to the authorities, he thought, as he opened it and gasped. The object was gone, and so was his shirt that he had wrapped it in. He was speechless, but he definitely wasn't going to go out there and chase after those guys. They creeped him out too much. Besides, perhaps it wasn't something he should have kept in his house after all. But the thing is, how did they get it? The front door was locked and he didn't let them inside the house. To this day, my dad shares this story from time to time with family and friends and he doesn't have an explanation for it. My dad believes in the men in black, of course, and now he believes in aliens too. Because as he says, what else could those men be? The way they acted, the way they seem to not even breathe when they stood there. They just can't be of this world. They Watched Our House by Jiminy. When I was really, really young, my father left my mother, leaving me to grow up in a single parent household. My mom made the best of it, and was soon able to work from home. I can't remember exactly what she did, but she was on her laptop a lot and made a lot of calls. I just don't ever remember asking. She seemed really happy 
and that's all that mattered to me. And because of that, I had a pretty great childhood myself. The only thing I really missed was friends. You see, we lived out of the way of town, at least two or three miles, and I didn't have any neighbors or neighbor kids that I could hang out with, so I spent a lot of my time on the old Game Boy, playing with G.I. Joe action figures, or romping about in the nearby woods. It was in those woods that I saw something that would keep me out of the woods for the next five or six years. It was around 8.30 one night. My mom was still working and had been on the phone for about four hours now. I could see that look in her eyes that she was exhausted and ready to just give up until tomorrow. I felt bad for her, so I tried to stay in the living room with her to keep her company. I was playing up at the windowsill. I'd gotten a new G.I. Joe with this launchable bazooka, and it made for a lot of fun new adventures. But beyond the little Hot Wheels, Army Men, and G.I. Joe action figures that I had before me, I saw movement outside. In the full moonlight, just beyond the tree line, I caught sight of pale flashes. As I stared into the trees, I saw it, or rather them. There were multiple figures, each of which was about eight feet tall, and they were extremely, and I mean unnaturally thin, like pale blue stick figures. They were walking from my left to the right, walking briskly as if they were trying to go somewhere. Their heads were bulbous and huge, but I couldn't see their eyes. Perhaps their eyes were just as dark as the night, or maybe they didn't have any. I can't say for sure, but what I do know is that I saw a dozen of them before I ran screaming to my mom, who irritably reprimanded me and told me to go sit back by the window. But I did not want to be by the window. So I covered my head with a blanket and I faced away from the window, afraid that if I turned back to look, there would be one of those things peering in at me from outside. That night I didn't sleep too well. I stayed up till about three in the morning, feeling like I was being watched, but I'm certain I was just paranoid. I mean, who wouldn't be after seeing alien-like figures walking through your woods? The next day, I tried to tell my mom again what I saw, which only reminded her that I had interrupted her business call, and she grew furious. Now keep in mind, she was usually quite nice and patient with me, but as last night had got on her nerves, being on that extended business call, I can understand why she was so frustrated still. That's probably why, after this next experience, I never went back to report my sightings to her. She wouldn't believe me, and I did not want to upset her any more than she was. The following night, we got a knock at our door. It must have been 9.30 p.m. I ran into the living room to see who it was, and I watched my mom answer the door. Outside stood a ridiculously tall man, the kind of guy that looked like he was too tall to even play basketball. It was so bizarre that it reminded me of the stick figure things that I'd seen the night before. In fear and amazement, I watched my mom and the guy converse. My mom greeted him, said hello, and asked if he needed help because it was so late. The man, dressed in all black, with what appeared to be black sunglasses hiding his eyes, responded with one sentence that it was chilling enough to have my mom screaming that she would call the cops if he didn't leave. That sentence was, are you ready to join the commune? Because we are waiting for you. Emotionless, the man turned and walked away. Oddly, he didn't walk back to a car or anything. He walked right into the woods, specifically the area that I'd been watching last night, and he disappeared into the wilderness and darkness. My mom slammed the door and locked it. When she turned around and saw that I was sitting there watching, she was quick to remind me that everything was okay and that that guy was probably just crazy and needed some mental help. I simply nodded my head and thought to myself, hoping that that was the end of it. Well, not just yet. For the next few nights that week, I saw that man dressed in all black. 
He was staring in through the window just from the tree line. I couldn't be sure because of his sunglasses, but I think he was staring at me. At one point, where I was on the breaking point ready to tell my mom about it, I saw him put his finger to his mouth and shush me before backing away and disappearing in the woods once more. That was the last I saw of him, the last of our strange events at that house. I'm glad that was all. I didn't know if I could handle any more supernatural weirdness. I don't know what I experienced way back then. It's been years now, and I've tried all I could to blame it on a fever dream or something. But recently, my mom has confirmed everything I've said here. She remembers getting mad when I tried to distract her from her business call, talking about blue stick men. She remembers the strange man in black at the door, and she remembers those few nights afterwards when all I would do was stare out the window. The Man in Black, submitted by Misty Waters. I haven't thought about this story in a long time. It's been decades, in fact. I'd buried the memory so deep that what happened so many years ago, I wish it all just stay in the recesses of my mind. But something happened just last weekend to bring those haunting memories to the forefront of my mind. I feel I need to write this down to get it out of my system, so to speak. I'm not the best at recalling things, so I hope you'll bear with me. When I was eight years old, my mom, dad, and younger brother would spend the summer weekends at my Aunt Carol and Uncle Jack's summer home. It was about an hour and a half outside our city. We've been doing this for years. I have a lot of happy memories of the weekends I spent there. We spent countless hours outside in the fresh air and in the sunshine playing until just before it'd get dark outside and we'd have to come in for dinner. I remember those weekends with great fondness well, I was sitting in the back of my Aunt Carol's car. It was very dark outside, and we were headed back home from our home in the country. I thought it was weird that I was the only one riding with my aunt. Usually, my mom and dad and brother would join us too, but tonight it was just me and her. And besides that, I always got creeped out when we drove home. The darkness was thick on those rural country roads, and it always made me wonder what lie in wait out there. My brother, Keith, would always tease me about being afraid of the dark. As much as I hate to admit it, he was in fact right. I thought that something was going to jump out from the trees at any second and snatch me right out of the car. I know I had an overactive imagination, that's for sure. We were driving over a really long straight stretch of road and I could tell that soon we'd be turning onto the main road that would lead us back to the city, and I, for one, could not wait to get back. I tried not to look out the window, because again, it would really scare me. There were no other lights on the road, just whatever illuminated from our own vehicle. Finally, my aunt turned onto the main road, and I was quite relieved. Even if it was still dark, there was some more light from the street lights that were coming up, so this was the last scary part of the road, and soon we'd be in the city. I could barely see the upcoming intersection. It was basically the last landmark before we got back to my aunt's house. I kept my head down. After a couple of minutes, I glanced back up to see the lights of the intersection, meaning we were almost there. I was about to dip my head back down from the window when I thought I saw something out of the corner of my eye. I looked back up, and to my surprise, there was a man standing directly under one of the streetlights outside at the intersection. I was surprised that there was anyone there at all. I had been through this intersection hundreds of times before, and I've never seen anyone walking or standing on this part of the road. It was vacant and rural out here, no sidewalks at all. The man stood there motionless. His head was down facing the paved road so I couldn't see his face. But what I could see was that he was dressed all in black in formal attire. He was wearing this stereotypical businessman suit, 
Black tie, black blazer, and white undershirt. I could even see the shine from his black shoes. We were slowing to a halt at the intersection, and I could tell my aunt hadn't seen the man yet. Either that, or she wasn't as weirded out by it. I just couldn't stop staring at the man, and as we got closer to coming to a stop, closer to the man, my heart began pounding in my chest. Still, the man didn't move. The man never even looked up. Something was really wrong about this. What was he doing out here this time of night? Why was he dressed like that? What was he looking at? We were about 10 feet away from the red light when the man suddenly bolted right out in front of my aunt's car. She swerved and screamed, just barely avoiding hitting him. And that's when I woke up, my heart racing, sweat all over my body, and I stared into the darkness of my room. I realized that I was in my bed at home, that it was all just a bad dream. That's what I assumed for the moment. It seemed so real though, I was glad it was just a dream, but I was still very shaken up. I looked at my clock to see it was just after midnight, and I decided to go downstairs to get a drink of water. I knew my mother would be up, as she worked an evening shift, and she never went to bed until around three in the morning. I walked down the steps and could hear muffled voices having a conversation. That was strange. There were voices I didn't recognize, voices that weren't coming from a radio or TV. Who was at our house at this time of night? I got to the bottom of the stairs, and to my surprise, my mom and dad were there, along with my Aunt Carol and Uncle Jack. My grandparents were also there, which was really surprising, because they were never up this late, let alone they would never be at our house at this time. I moved to the table and stood next to my mother, but they were so engrossed on the conversation that they barely even noticed I was there. My grandmother was glaring at my aunt, asking her if there was really someone on the road, asking if the man in all black really ran in front of her car, causing her to swerve and hit the utility pole. My jaw dropped. The thing I had just dreamt about had apparently really happened, and I wasn't even there. My aunt looked back at my grandmother with tears in her eyes, saying, yes, he jumped in front of my car. I tried to avoid him, but I hit the pole. She finished quietly. My grandmother, though, found that hard to believe, since no one was there to witness the man she was talking about. What I didn't know, though, was that at the time my Aunt Carol had a drinking problem and she had been sober for over four years. But my grandmother was doubtful and she thought that her daughter had been drinking again and that's what caused the accident. My aunt asked my mother, you believe me, Linda, don't you? She asked through the tears. My mother began playing with her earring like she always did when she was nervous. Let's just say every time my grandmother was around, my mother was always nervous. Before my mom could answer, her earring fell out of her ear and she went down to pick it up. I believe you, my dad said though, reassuringly. My grandmother shot him a look of disappointment and surprise, but didn't say anything. My grandmother loved my dad. He was the son she never had, so she never wanted to argue with him. I decided since everyone was ignoring me that I would just go back to bed. I went back to my room, but I just laid there for the rest of the night, amazed and scared at the fact that I dreamed of the man in black, that I dreamed of what just happened. The next morning, I woke up and went back downstairs. My mom was there, and she asked me if I wanted breakfast. I decided to just have cereal and asked why Aunt Carol and my grandparents were at the house last night. My mother gave me this strange and suspicious look, then said, uh, what, are you, what are you talking about? There was no one here last night. Her reply was odd, like she was trying to hide something. But as a naive kid, I continued, I saw Grandma, and she was asking Aunt Carol about her accident and about the man that ran in front of her car. My mother looked at me quizzically, and then she said, Aunt Carol is fine, honey. I've just spoken with her. 
she would have told me if she was in an accident. But I continued. I saw all of you there asking her about the man that jumped in front of her car. Aunt Carol was very upset and Grandma seemed mad. You were playing with your earring and dropped it, remember? By then, I was so worried about my own memories that I was pleading with her. Honey, you must have been dreaming. I promise no one was here last night and Aunt Carol is fine. And I got quiet, not wanting to believe that my mom would lie to me. I was very close to my aunt, so I hoped she wouldn't keep something like this a secret from me. Maybe it was all a dream after that, a dream within a dream, even though I never went back to sleep. For weeks after that, I couldn't get all of this out of my mind. I had an eerie feeling like something bad had happened, and I couldn't shake it. About two months went by, and I'd finally gotten past the incident. I'd come home one day from swim team practice to eat dinner with my mom and dad. They were already at the table, though, when I got there. There was no dinner, and they were waiting on me. I knew something was wrong, because my mom was once again playing with her earring. My dad made me sit down, and then he began talking, but all I heard was, Aunt Carol has been in an accident. I got chills throughout my body as he told me word by word exactly what had happened. Just the other night, a man dressed in all black had jumped in front of her vehicle, causing my aunt to swerve right into a pole. She was bruised and a little banged up and the car was badly damaged, but she was going to be fine. I was very pleased to hear that my aunt was okay, but I was consumed by an entirely eerie feeling. Was I dreaming again? A dream within a dream within a dream? Was this one real? I began to doubt my own existence. And who was this man in black? And why was this all happening on repeat to me? I then decided to explain to my dad about my dream. After I was done, my parents exchanged a glance. You know, that look they give each other when their child is acting weird. I learned years later that just an hour before I came home that day, my mom, dad, and grandparents were at the table discussing the accident with my aunt. My mother had been talking and playing with her earring and it had fallen out of her ear. He said when I told him about my dream, it really freaked him out. It was so coincidental that it couldn't have all been a coincidence. Well, decades go by and I never thought about this incident until just last weekend. I was heading to my boyfriend's house for a long weekend. My boyfriend lives about an hour away from me and the drive is nice enough. He lives in an area just as rural as the one I was talking about. I was on the last leg of the drive, almost there. I just had to merge onto this one mile stretch of road and that would bring me within minutes of his house. It was a hot day and the night was hot too. And I had the windows up and the AC on. Save for a few lights from the radio, it was mostly dark out and I was used to the darkness then and it never bothered me as much anymore. Besides, that was a road I knew well. I had visited my boyfriend out there many times before and at night there was hardly any traffic on the road at all. About halfway down the road, I saw an intersection in the distance and I could barely make out the red light in the darkness. The next thing I knew, a car pulled out of the side street and just missed hitting my car by inches. I was angry and a bit surprised. There was plenty of room behind me, so that person could have just waited. I calmed down though and I didn't want anything to ruin my weekend. So I gathered myself and looked back towards the light. And that's when I saw him. He was just standing there, under the street light, dressed in all black. It was the exact same man from my dreams, the exact same man that had been described in the report of my aunt's car crash. My heart stopped, and I couldn't believe that he was actually there. But this time, instead of looking down at the pavement, he was staring at me behind dark sunglasses my mind flashed back to all those years ago. Was he waiting for me all this time? 
and at that moment, I realized he was. I truly believed he was trying to get at me, not my aunt. But before I could think anything else, the car that had nearly hit me got to the intersection, and just as they did, the man jumped in front of their car. They swerved to avoid him, and her car ran into a small embankment, and I heard a loud crash. In sheer terror, I slammed on my brakes. I stopped the car and looked around, and I saw the man on the side of the road, looking down at the car crash he had just caused. He looked back at me for a moment, then he looked back at the accident. He pulled something small and lightweight out of his pocket. It was rectangular, like a camera. But if it was a camera, it was the smallest I had ever seen, and back then I didn't think they got that small. The reason I thought it was a camera was because he pointed it at the accident. It flashed a bright, bright flash that consumed the entire darkness for a brief moment. Then without ever looking back at me, he put the camera thing back in his pocket and walked into the woods, disappearing amongst the trees. As soon as I reclaimed my courage, I jumped out of my car and ran to see if the people in the other car were okay. There was a woman in the driver's seat. She was disoriented and had a cut on her cheek and a few bruises, but she seemed fine altogether. She asked me if I saw the man too, and I told her in a shaky voice that I had. At the same time, we looked around each other, looking for the man, probably making sure that he wasn't there about to jump out at us. Luckily, the dark stranger was nowhere to be found. She looked at me and asked with trembling lips, where did he go? I told her I don't know, but then she kept asking the same question. Y you saw him too, right? You saw him, he was really there. And repeatedly I reassured her, yes, he was there. It wasn't her imagination. She walked back to her car, shaking her head. It looked like she was making a phone call, so I walked back to my car. I stayed parked on the side of the road for a while. I was too shaken up to continue my drive. I kept thinking that the man in black was waiting for me and had been waiting for me for a long time. I don't know who he is, what he is, or what he wants, but I really don't want to find out. I think he showed up that night to remind me that he was still there and waiting and that I would be seeing him again. Just that thought makes me shiver. That night, after a long time of just sitting in my car, long after the emergency services got there and cleaned everything up, I just sat on the side of the road, watching a few cars pass by, unsure of my own life, more confused and terrified than I had ever been before. Finally, I started my car and I finished my drive to my boyfriend's house. I didn't tell him this story. I simply couldn't. I didn't think he'd believe me, so there was no point to it. I did manage to enjoy my weekend somewhat, but even now, I'm unable to stop thinking about the man in black. If there ever comes a day when he tries to get me to be the next accident, I won't be swerving to avoid him. If you're out there and listening, man in black, I'm going to put the gas pedal to the floor and hope that the car drives right through you. Army Men in Black, submitted by Joe L. The men in black are real. I am familiar with the black suits, fedoras, and unusual facial features in most MIB accounts, but the ones I encountered, though they were dressed in all black, were as much human as you and I. Back in 2012, I was in Afghanistan taking part in operations there. Our main purpose was to look for roadside bombs and explosives around a major southern city. It was pretty uneventful, a few explosions here and there, a sniper trying his best, and the very rare gunfight. Until one night we were called for a quick reaction mission. We donned our plate carriers and combat gear in a moment's notice. 
we learned that the Afghan National Army was just in a complex ambush and needed backup and medical aid. So we sped there as fast as we could in a very empty, hilly area. It was about two in the morning and it was very dark. So dark that the stars and moon provided no illumination. Most of the heavenly objects seemed to be absent that night. That was until one of the gunners saw a bright blue light in the sky. He even announced it on the comms that close air support was above us. We were not aware of close air support, but given how things were going, it wasn't surprising to us that air support was needed. Then two more blue lights pierced the black veil above us, then three more, then four more, an entire squadron. But then they began to turn red and violet and green. And I'm not talking about the faint, flashing satellite-style lights in the deep sky. These were bright orbs above us, like not-too-distant spotlights shining in our direction. The gunners were reporting this, but the vehicle crews did not see it. Our platoon leader asked where they were, and as if the pilots of those aircraft were listening somehow, they suddenly sped up to appear in front of our convoy, and at that moment, they were only 300 meters from the ground, away from us. In only a few seconds flat, these lights stood still in front of us, then just shot up in the night sky at blinding impossible speed, never to be seen again by us. Even their lights quickly disappeared, leaving us on top of those hills, dumbfounded in the darkness. Now, that whole time we had been communicating what we saw on the net, we continued on our way until we received notice to turn around and RTB. The platoon leader protested, saying we were already almost to the Afghanis, but the response was, this is from six. Six is the numerical designation for commanders. Six usually refers to the company or battalion commander, so this came from way high up. So we had no other choice. We turned around and made our way back to the FOB. Upon arrival, we were instructed in a firm fashion to park our trucks, return back to the living area, and under no circumstances were we to go to the MWR or tell anyone what we saw under threat of Article 15. We were just tired, so most of us just went back to bed. A few hours later, the platoon was met by the battalion commander. He said that he cannot give any details, but some very high up men want to talk to each of us one at a time. We waited nervously and confused in an empty tent while one at a time we all left to be interviewed. First it was the lower enlisted, then it was the sergeants, then our platoon leader would be last. I was a staff sergeant at the time, so I waited a bit before I was called in. When I walked in the room, I saw a black man over six feet tall, easily 200 pounds of pure muscle, far bigger than I was. He was sitting at a table waiting very patiently. He was wearing, no joke, black boots, black combat pants, a black combat shirt, and black Oakleys hanging off of his neck. He shook my hand with a firm grip and introduced himself as Major Smith from the US Air Force. And that's when it hit me that I may be in the presence of the fabled men in black but he seemed very jovial and engaging. He asked me where I was from, what my hobbies were, if I was married, generally just trying to get to know me. Before long, he was asking me about the events from only a few hours ago. I told him exactly what I saw and such. Even though there was a voice recorder on the table, he took notes, and after I told him what I saw, it was his turn to speak. Sergeant, it seems to me that what you described to me was a malfunctioning UAV. I don't think it's anything more. You see, the Air Force has been playing around with a new type of UAV, and as it's so new, sometimes things get out of hand. Do you understand what I'm saying, Sergeant? Uh, yes, sir, I said. He continued. Good. I mean, it's nothing really to get worked up about. I would just leave it alone and forget about it. You have a few more months here. You should be more worried about that. Take care of yourself and your fellow men. If you do things you shouldn't, if you don't stay in your lane, accidents can happen. 
Do you know what I'm saying, Sergeant? Yes, sir. All right, then. That's good to hear. Do you have any questions for me? No, sir, I replied. All right, take it easy and stay safe out there. It took me a while to process what had just happened, and it seemed my platoon was doing the same. And it finally dawned on me, the easygoing nature, the questions, the attitude change at the end. It was to make me feel at ease at first, to make me let my guard down so they'd have a profile on me. I was wondering though, if what he said towards the end about accidents happening, was that a threat of some kind? Or maybe he generally cared about a fellow service member? I don't know, but I think his tone said it all. He was implying something. His tone had completely changed from how he had been talking. From that moment on, I began to question what we really saw. There was no way in the world it was just some malfunctioning UAV. We saw something we weren't supposed to. I don't know if it's part of this world or another, but it's something they don't want me talking about. Everything after that during my time in the military, it was all a blur. Some of my former platoon mates can't even recall the events of that night, and I wonder if the Air Force really does have some kind of men in black program. I'm not entirely sure, and I wish I could say that I will never forget this event, but it seems every day that goes by, my memory of it becomes hazy and cloudier, even in spite of how traumatizing and bizarre it was. A Possible Men in Black Encounter, submitted by Anonymous. I'm proud to say that we live in a very nice neighborhood, and it's usually pretty quiet and relaxing. One hot, bright summer day, I was home alone sitting in front of my computer with my music cranked up. All the doors were locked and my family was out. I was home alone. No problem though, I was in my 20s and loved my alone time. Suddenly, I heard a noise come from around the mailbox outside, so I went to get the mail, thinking that they had just delivered it. I was shutting the screen door when I noticed two all black, sleek, flawless cars driving by, slowly down our street. I had also noticed four men in black suits, all of which were wearing black sunglasses with a small earpiece that had a cord going into their suits. At the same time, they all got out of their vehicles, carrying black briefcases. They were all Caucasian with either brown or black hair at the same length and they all suddenly turned their heads to look at me while they were walking to certain neighbors' houses. I got really nervous and a bit frightened, to be honest, because the way they moved and acted, it was like they were all one person, the same person. They were definitely on some sort of mission, and I didn't want to know what for. I felt like I stumbled upon something I shouldn't be seeing. Two of the men were going to the house right next to ours, walking down the driveway. So I ran back inside, quickly shutting and locking the front door. I stepped around the corner into the dining room so I could hide because I knew they saw me. Soon after, I began to hear loud repetitive knocking as one of them said, hello, we'd like to have a word with you. I'd never been in this situation before and their demeanors intimidated me so much that I couldn't move. My heart sank and my stomach dropped. I was trying to come up with a plan when one of them pounded on the front door even harder and now forcefully said, ma'am, we just saw you walk into your house. Let us in, this won't take very long. My eyes widened, I couldn't call anyone. The phone was right next to the front door, of course. The dog was going crazy, barking and growling and snarling when suddenly the front doorknob began to turn. They were trying to get into the house without permission. I was stunned, my worst nightmares coming true. I was praying that they'd just go away. Strangely, after a moment, nothing happened and everything got quiet. I crept up slowly to the front door and the two of them were still out there, just standing there. 
After about five minutes of them just standing still, they turned around, walked down the road, then began to approach my next neighbor's house. The other two men from the opposite car also started to walk towards the house, but they suddenly changed direction, and then they all met up in the middle of my neighbor's driveway. I decided to call my mom, and I was thinking about even calling the police. But then they all began to walk robotically in unison back to their vehicles. I went to the living room window, trying to peek through the curtains. I wanted to see what they were up to, and just like that, they quickly drove off. It should have taken them much longer to get back to their cars. Watching that happen was weird. It was almost like they knew I was watching them. One of them stared right at the window I was peeking through. At that distance, there was no way he could tell I was looking at them, but I have a strong feeling he knew I was there and he knew I was watching. He kept his head pointed in my direction as they passed by, and then they all turned their heads looking at me from the back seat. I glanced away for a moment, then for some reason I continued looking out the window, and then just like that, their vehicles were gone. They were just gone. Maybe they were the FBI, maybe some sort of governmental fraction. Perhaps I had an encounter with the men in black. Whoever these men were, they were very specific in appearance. There was no nonsense or foolishness involved in their manner. Everyone I mentioned this to had no clue who they might be. And to this very day, I wonder what they were up to. I hope I never have to see someone like that again. Keep your eye out for the men in black, because if you see something strange, something even more strange may follow, and they might even be dressed in a really nice black suit. Don't let that fool you, though, because if you let your guard down, who knows what they might do to you. Good night. Be sure to like, share, comment, and subscribe if you enjoyed the video. I'm looking for jogging stories and backpacking stories for my next videos, so if you've got some of those, send them over at darknessprevails.org. If you want to support my channel further, think about going to my Patreon and donating any amount at patreon.com slash darknessprevails, and you'll get your name in the credits. Or think about clicking that shop button or go to morbidmonsters.com to get some Darkness Prevails merchandise. Thank you. Now, as usual, here are my five favorite early comments from my previous video about 10 real haunted hotels. Kane Seven of I says, come play with us, Danny, forever and ever. Okay, but only if we get to play doctor. Sir Lucas says, I've got a horror story. Once I threw up in a hotel room and a cleaning lady had to come and clean it up. Ew. I bet she used that weird sawdust graham cracker crumb stuff too. Dark Mermaid Queen says, Yes, my favorite horror YouTuber is back. Aw, thank you. Aren't you the one that wanted more ghost stories? If you guys want ghost stories, leave a comment. I love ghosties. Beth Ann Shaver says, I screamed when I seen Darkness put a video up. My mom was like, what happened? I was like, Darkness put up a new video, and mom rolled her eyes. Don't you worry, Beth Ann. We're gonna convert your mom to the fandom here real soon. Demonetized483 says, Sweet, Saturdays are a tradition. Let's get this started. Not for my channel, they aren't. For some weird reason, Fridays and Saturdays are my worst days for views, but they're often the best for other YouTubers, which leads me to believe that you guys use my stories for work days, which is awesome. I promise not to tell anybody. Just don't get yourself fired because you wanted a good spook here and there. Anyways, guys, thanks so much for tuning in to another Darkness Prevails classic. More scary stories are coming soon, so stay tuned. Until next time, here are the credits to my awesome patrons who continue to support me with that little extra. Remember to stay safe out there and stay creepy because this world is a strange one.